Hi. I would like to talk about this word. <laughs> <laughs> Following my husband. From, this, from the perspective of an artist. And uh, anybody, and I suspect most of you in this room, have tried to do creative work at some point or other in the last few days and in your careers. And anyone who's ever tried to do creative work has come up against this word. Um, people are not going to like your stuff. They're sometimes not even going to look at your stuff. You're not going to like your stuff. Somebody somewhere is going to say no to you. And if you choose to make um, your own creative work, your life's work, you are going to encounter that word a lot, which is why most people um, do not make art their life's work. Um, there's some amazing statistic on uh, art school graduates, how few of them actually go on to become working artists, and it's pretty grim. Um, let me see if I can figure out which remote. Ah, that's the one I want. The fact is, it's extremely hard to be an artist. It's painful. Um, it's, you know, it's a career path that is fraught with alcoholism and sanity, cutting off ears, um, poverty, misery of all kinds. Um, but the, the particular kind of no that I'm going to talk about today has to do with um, being blocked. Um, everybody has heard the term writer's block, but it's not uh, unique to writers. Um, it affects anybody who has ever tried to do anything creative. Buckminster Fuller famously didn't speak for two whole years um, because he just didn't feel he had anything to say. And um, I'm going to tell a story in the five minutes that I have about a particular instance of being completely blocked, um, which was devastating for a while and then ended up being the most fruitful thing that had happened to me in a long time and uh, probably all of you have got a story like that, and um, I'd like to take an opportunity to honor that process. Um, I'll try to read this poem quickly in the time that I have. Um, it's one of my favorite poems about being blocked. Advice to Writers by Billy Collins. Even if it keeps you up all night, wash down the walls and scrub the floor of your study before composing a syllable. Clean the place as if the Pope were on his way. Spotlessness is the niece of inspiration. The more you clean, the more brilliant your writing will be, so do not hesitate to take to the open fields to scour the undersides of rocks or swab in the dark forest upper branches, nests full of eggs. When you find your way back home and stow the sponges and brushes under the sink, you will behold in the light of dawn the immaculate altar of your desk, a clean surface in the middle of a clean world. From a small vase, sparkling blue, lift a yellow pencil, the sharpest of the bouquet, and cover pages with tiny sentences like long rows of devoted ants that followed you in from the woods. It's a nice poem. It doesn't work. <laughs> you, can, you can try, but you cannot clean your way out of being blocked. The only thing you can do is recognize that in the most devastating, paralyzing creative experience, there is the potential for something new and wonderful to come forth. So here's my story. Just one story. I was working on a series of paintings a few years ago um, that started out as being fairly representational seascapes in oil, big seascapes. And as I worked on this series, they grew more and more abstract. I don't know if you can see the slide very well, but that is a, it looks like a gray painting, but it's actually many shades of gray, and the lower half looks a bit like water, and the upper half looks a little bit like sky. Can you see it? So I was working on a lot of these. I had a whole number of them all going at once. And they weren't all gray. Some of them were black. <laughs> but some of them were also the traditional beautiful turquoise and azure and, and um, aquamarine colors of the ocean and the sky. But they were pretty abstract. I mean, you, you didn't always necessarily know at first glance that it was supposed to be a seascape. My friends were incredibly encouraging and supportive. They said things like, oh, they're so meditative. And oh, it makes me think of Rothko. And I was feeling great and just moving along with this feeling like it was really working. One of the things I was doing incidentally is I was mixing beeswax with the oil paint to get a very sort of matte, opaque surface, um, which I would then combine with oil paint that hadn't been mixed with wax, which is much more shiny and reflective. So you're getting this kind of play of light across the surface of the thing, and I thought that was really cool. Um, until I opened Art in America, to this review of a show by Byron Kim, a series of seascapes, large, square, divided in the middle by a horizon line. Some of them 
you know, just looked like color fails, others not. And I, at my, first, my first reaction was to freak out. Um, then I said, well, I'll, you know, read the review. I'll learn something from it. It's not going to stop me from doing this process. Byron Kim, you know, Rothko-like, meditative. <laughs> One of the interesting things he's doing is he's mixing beeswax with the paint to come up with this sort of reflective surface, blah, blah, blah. And I read this, and I was just completely stopped in my tracks. And I knew that I shouldn't be, and I knew that I should go on with it, and I knew that it didn't matter that somebody else was doing something so similar, and that therefore every person that I showed my work to would think I was ripping this guy off. I knew that none of that should matter, and that I should go on, but I couldn't, and I didn't. And I actually haven't painted a canvas since then. Um, but it's OK. <laughs> This is one of his paintings, and um, I would show you the one that I did that looked exactly like that, but I destroyed it. I had to. I destroyed it. It's kind of horrible. Um, you know, I talked to artist friends, and they all said, don't worry about it, and don't read art magazines, and you know, you know your work is your work, and all the things that you say. And I knew that all to be true, and I still could not do a thing. I was completely flummoxed. Um, so I did something completely different which at the time was something that I was also working on but wasn't taking seriously. It was just something I was kind of playing with on the side. And it ended up being much more fruitful for me. Um, and it's continued to this day, this, this body of work. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that I got blocked on the seascapes because this ended up being so much better. And the way that it happened was I had also been trying to paint these landscape-like semi-abstract paintings that were actually close-ups of a particular flower in my yard. It's a Brugmansia flower, also called Tree de Tour. And it's kind of interesting because it's this very complicated shape and it also has all sorts of uh, interesting facts about it. It's a hallucinogenic and, and poisonous and, and very uh, fragrant and beautiful. I had to get rid of the plant when I had children because I couldn't take any chances of them hallucinating and dying. Um, <laughs> But it's, you know, it's that, this is a photograph, by the way. It looks a little bit like a painting, but it is a photograph. And uh, I was just looking at it from a lot of different angles, um, mostly in the dark, just being interested in the shape of the thing and how the darkness around it would interact with it and hold it. And um, curiously enough, it was the first few images from the series that ended up getting the most media attention. And you know, um, pretty much every article about this work that's come out has used some of the images that I made in those very first days of working on this project, which is kind of neither here nor there. Anyway, since then, um, I've continued to kind of push this idea, um, looking at different kinds of shapes from the natural world. Um, the pictures are large. They're printed on a very matte paper, uh, no beeswax, but um, it's uh, not a very reflective paper that I use when I can, and that gives them this very kind of silky look. Um, and I will conclude by just showing you a few more pictures. Oops, let me go back to that one. It's one of my favorite. That one was actually commissioned by the Museum of Sex in New York <laughs> for um, an exhibition they were doing on Chinese erotica, and they couldn't put actual Chinese erotica, I guess, on the posters and ads for the show, so they, they got me to shoot a, a lotus blossom in a sort of suggestive way. That's another lotus flower from that series. Anyway, as I say, I've been going on with this ever since and um, working on some variations on the theme, trying l more recently to get a little bit more movement into it. This is a, a picture of plum blossoms. It's about 100 inches high by 80 inches wide in its uh, native file size. These are extremely large. That's a plum branch without the, bl without the branch. And um, also monkeying around a little bit with uh, getting vines to uh, say things. Um, that's from a series that I'm working on right now called Passion Vine Letters. Um, so I want to end with this thought, one of my other favorite quotes. Um, being blocked is part of doing any kind of creative work, whether it's marketing or haiku. Um, it's going to happen. It's going to be awful. And um, all you can do is see what you can do with it. Thank you.